John Gilstrap. Johnny Boy. Good morning. Nice to be here. You are sitting so much higher up today. Hey, listen, the, the boss, the, the mogul, got us all new chairs. So I can actually sit <laughs> sit up straight and the chair won't collapse. I, I literally so, assembled your chair yesterday along with the boss's wife, Gresham. Oh, wow. We were trying to decipher what looked to be some form of French and Spanish instructions. Is that why there are no arms on the chair? Is that because that spare parts and then... And, and it's, you know, like when you rip your engine apart, what's this? So yes, exactly. Exactly. Or surgeons surgeons do that, too. What, oh, well, that's a squiggly looking thing. And we don't need that if it ain't attached. Also, Jefferson County prosecuting attorney Matt Harvey, who I might add, came in uh, with like a fedora. Camel hair. That's not coat. a fedora. Man, it was looking good. That's not a fedora. Well, it's kind of like one. It's not a fedora. Yeah, it was very totally adamant not. about it not being a fedora. It's not a fedora. What is it? Hey, it's tilt your hat. mic up because right now your mic's pointed at your chest. It's a well, it's this new chair. I'm like, <laughs> I'm towering. I'm gonna need like a phone book to set on that. Is, how about that? Is that better? It's roughly better. And, and it's not a fedora. I like that. A fedora is just is just just sorry a about hat. saying it was. It's a, a style of hat. I don't. It's I don't know. I just have a different association okay. with fedoras. I'm, like a, I'm really sorry. I said that was a fedora. It's more like a. A winter hat. A, win- a gentleman's. Gentleman's hat. Like uh, I'm getting. I'm Why don't you put, put it on and show everybody? Preparing well, for put, the put fox on your hat. hat. Put on your hat. He's got headphones on, Rob. It's all right. Put it on over the headphones, right? It it fits better without the headphones. It's like a combination cowboy hat fedora. Yeah. yeah. It's a fedora. That's it. That's just missing the feather is all. <laughs> also, uh, delegate Mike Hornby, aka the mogul. Good morning, Rob. Good to see you. Good to see you, Welcome too. Welcome back, man. I haven't yeah. seen a lot of you lately. We were at interims. So I know. Well, before we were, that, you were away. Before that, I was uh, when on, you're on here, a little vacation. When you're here lately, you've been distant. Yes. This is like we're not communicating as much as we used to. <laughs> did you, did holiday you, season. Did you get a new younger host? Is that what happened? Did a new younger no, host come no, into your life? I can't find anybody that'll take the, as, <laughs> as, as little as you take. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> and taking less next year, too, apparently. Why is that? Price cuts, baby. Price cuts. Across the board, price cuts. <laughs> hey, let's welcome in House Majority Leader Eric Householder. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Rob, and good morning to all your... Uh, I'm, I'm just honored to have all these high-profile uh, hosts today. Oh, it's so, a distinguished crew. They, they are. They really are. They do such a good job, too. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you guys? Doing well, well thank you. I want to keep you to keep going on that. <laughs> <with you. laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> good morning, Eric. Yeah, there you are, Rob's man. dying. <laughs> He's good coughing out a lung well, right we're here. We're all coughing. I mean, it's yeah. that time of the year, yeah. you know. Goodness gracious. Uh, so we just got back from interims, Mr. Hornby did. Uh, yeah. And uh, Eric, were you participating in those as well? I was down there, and uh, I do have a grape with you. I usually call in around the first of the month to go over the revenue numbers, so obviously someone must have took my spot this, this month. Yeah. So you, you texted me kind of late, so... But, uh, yes, you did not get the first of the month numbers in, Mister. <laughs> well, we Mister. Yeah, yeah Mister. Blair over. beat you to it. I know, I know. Yeah. But I figure Mr. I could Mr. do Blair a little Trump overview too. of what I listened in on on some of these committees, and and maybe we can talk about Medicaid, state Medicaid, and then maybe go over the revenue numbers. Yeah, let's let's start with the revenue numbers, right? Because we ran a, a surplus in November. We're almost halfway through December, and yep, that means the end of the calendar year very soon. Yeah, five months in, and uh, the month of November, we finished a strong $44 million to the positive. And after five months, we're $286 million to the good right now. Now, mm-hmm. so almost $300 million. I expect we, uh, we could probably be around $700 million by the end of June. It's very dual, doable. Uh, it's roughly about, you know, we have to be positive $60 million every month up until June, and we could be right around $700 million. Excellent. And does that trigger the uh, the next uh, tax cut? That has nothing to do with the tax to cut. Do. Okay. Not, nothing. That, this is all just surplus money that we're talking about. Yes. So. And what, what uh, triggers the tax cut? We went through this in detail before, <laughs> but maybe you could give us the detail again. What triggers the tax cuts are your CPI rate and uh, your, your revenue, your ending year revenue has to be higher than your 2019 base revenue. And if you meet those two conditions, it's just a mathematical formula. They'll take the revenue, multiply it by the CPI, and this will happen around uh, July, August, and that's when you'll see your next rate reduction. July, August. Yep. And that would be one, possibly as much as one-tenth of a percent? No, possibly as much as 10%. 
Well, that's, more t- that's the same thing. It just kind of depends on where you want to put the decimal point, I guess, right? So, yeah, up to 10%. Yeah, gotcha. So. Okay, so uh, very good. But it doesn't have to be the full 10%. It does not have to be the full 10%. And we did a 21 and a quarter percent cut last year, mm-hmm. right? And you, eventually, if you live long enough, this could go down to zero. No. Well, well, I think you're being a... Mathematically, a little bit. I mean, mathematically, if you do reach ten percent a year, you're talking seven years. No, be, well, no, don't don't do this, John Doyle okay. math, yeah. literal <laughs> literal math. Well, I mean, if it, your okay. name is not John Doyle, don't <laughs> it, start that. It always there always be something there if it's you're only taking whittling away ten percent, right? No, it's because it's not it's not ten percent of what's left. You're talking about a one hundred percent of the pie, and if you go down ten percent from the original pie, right. eventually the pie is gone. I thought it was 10% after the 21%. So, so don't overthink it. Okay. Uh, okay. This is, yeah, this is not MIT. <laughs> we do have an MIT graduate that serves with Hornby and I. So, uh, oh, Hornby's he, curious. Who is that? It's, uh, I believe it's um, Helen Brand from uh, Romney, Hampshire County. That is true. Yeah, nice. he was a he MIT He does overthink graduate, things. So. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> he does everything. He thinks so. <laughs> He's actually my office mate. See? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, and it looks like a pretty good shot that that will happen in the upcoming uh, spring to yes, summer. Yes, and I think the public pressure, I think, is you're still going to see a constant movement to try to get to a point to eliminate the personal income tax. And uh, I think the wheels are in motion. Uh, you see a lot of candidates right now out there campaigning, talking about uh, eliminating the personal income tax. Uh, some candidates want to eliminate it tomorrow. I get it. Uh, it'd be very, very difficult to do. But uh, I just now that we've we've put us we put ourselves on a path. I think it's very achievable, and uh, we can we can test economic theory like I've talked about. You know, economic theory says if you want more of something, you tax less of it. So we'll see if the econ- economic theory is right. Uh, can I jump in here with a question, sure. please? So the the personal income tax makes up, what, about a, a billion dollars of the... No, it's $2.4 billion of our general revenue budget of about 5.4. Okay. So what what will replace that? Well, that's a great thing, uh, or a great question. As, as, you know, as growth increases... If economic theory is proven right and we will see an influx of growth, obviously you're going to see more in sales taxes, you'll see more in personal property taxes, and the list goes on and on and on. So that's what you're counting on if you're going to see uh, if economic theory actually works. Does that make sense? It makes sense, yes, sir. When we were first pitching the um, decrease in the personal income tax, one of the justifications was that we would – become more attractive to businesses who want to relocate into West Virginia. Right. Now, it's very early into the process now, but are you aware, has, has this become a, a real marketing tool to get businesses to come into the state? I can tell you, I've heard it from the speaker, I've heard it from the Senate president, and I've actually heard it from Amazon and others. What we're doing in West Virginia is creating national waves. People are hearing about that we have put ourselves on a path to uh, eliminate the personal income tax. Keep in mind, a lot of these tech companies, when I went out to Seattle back in July, uh, you know, the state of Washington has no state income tax. So you have a lot of these uh, tech companies that have located out there because of those reasons. So uh, will we ever get to that point? Maybe. Uh, how long? I can't predict. But uh, as long as we keep putting ourselves on that same path and that same trajectory, you're, you're creating an environment where somebody is willing to take a risk, and that's what it is whenever you start a business. You, you want these risk takers to come in and, and start a business, hire employees, you know, put West Virginians to work, and that's what it takes. Eric Halsorder is the House Majority Leader. He is with us on the program this morning. Uh, Eric, in regards to what took place at the interim sessions, uh, is there anything that we need to know about? We're going to go over Mr. Hornby's stuff coming up in uh, a few minutes. But yeah, I didn't get a chance to, to listen in to education, but uh, from what I listened in on judiciary, um, and I'm kind of interested in this bill, I'm, I want to learn a little bit more about it. I'm sure it could become. Remember, a lot of this stuff that we talk about during our interim session may become uh, legislation during our regular legislative session. So um, judiciary was talking about a bill 
that they had last year, House Bill 3498, it addressed consumer data per, uh, protections. And they want to limit, you know, put limitations on entities that collect and sell personal information. So what I gathered, the main gist of the bill was that they would limit the collection of personal data to what is reasonable and necessary, uh, maintain security practices uh, to safeguard that data, and, and things like that. So I, I want to learn a little bit more about that bill. Uh, but Brian Casto presented that bill to the Joint Committee on Judiciary. In fact, maybe, I don't know if you're going to have uh, Charles Trump on or, or any any of our other members on. Maybe you can talk to him about that. It's House Bill 3498. Another bill that expressed an interest to me was on government organization. Um, it's another bill that ran during the 2023 session. It was uh, Senate Bill 539, but it would allow governmental entities bidding out construction project work Excuse me, to establish a maximum budgeted amount for the project. And if the bids exceed that amount, then the state entity may negotiate a contract with the lowest uh, responsive and responsible bidder. Now, I would caution, um, I'm, I'm just a little worried about that bill because with state entities uh, or any state project that you bid on, you could have certain companies that could cons- you know, consistently maybe lowball their bid just to be in the door to um, to negotiate. And uh, I just want to make sure this doesn't give a, a, a cause of action to where someone's going to participate and be or create bad actors to kind of scheme the system just to get awarded uh, these governmental contracts. But um, that's what went on in uh, GovOrg. So I'm going to watch that bill. And then, obviously, in Joint Committee on Government and Finance, we talked about our, our Medicaid budget. So for fiscal year 2025, they're projecting a uh, basically a $114 million deficit. And the reason they're projecting it is our FMAP, F-M-A-P, which is our federal uh, Medicaid assistant percentage, is going to get lower. And basically right now our FMAP's right around 74.5. One zero percent. So every time you hear someone say, hey, every time the state contributes a dollar, we get three dollars from the federal government for our, our Medicaid budget. Well, as as uh, that FMAP would increase, you would get more federal dollars if you have a lower per capita income um, in your state. But our our uh, per capita income is increasing, so now our our FMAP, our FMAP rate is decreasing, so we're going to get less for federal dollars. Well, you got to be really careful when you're discussing these things that start with F, Eric. You just have well, to be very yeah. careful. <laughs> yeah, and all these acronyms. I hate acronyms. But, is, that, uh, is that a growth problem? Is, it is. Is that I what mean, I understand? It, we're, we're starting to see. So it's a, the, the bright, shining star of all this is our per capita income is increasing in the state of West Virginia. And uh, right now we have about 36% of our residents on Medicaid. So of almost a little more than one-third of our population is on Medicaid. So as you start to see our, our per, per capita income increase, you're going to see less and less federal dollars coming into the state uh, for Medicaid. But what that means is more out-of-pocket for the state. So they're projecting about a $114 million deficit. Uh, I would caution your listeners not to be too alarmed. I can tell you uh, my four years as your House Finance Chair, there were several years that they were estimating a $231 million uh, hit to Medicaid, but it never came to fruition. So we're, they're, they're just estimating this two years out, uh, and, but they're basing it on the FMAP being reduced from the federal government. So. Very good. All right. Yeah. Uh, any other questions for Eric? I do. Eric. Tell us about the campaign show. I've been hearing really good things about you traveling many, many miles to many meetings. Well, thanks for asking. And, and you're right, I've been crisscrossing all across the state. Uh, Friday, I was in uh, Nicholas County. Uh, I recently just got back from Raleigh County. Uh, I'm trying to spend more time, uh, get out to Mon County and Putnam County. But uh, no, everything's going good. I'm getting a good reception, meeting a lot of people. And that's the key. I do like to talk to people, and I think uh, once I get around them, once they get a chance to learn about me, uh, they feel very comfortable. They, uh, I'm, I'm hearing good things. But, no, the campaign's going very well. 
I just purchased a large purchase, purchase made yesterday for yard signs, so I'm gearing up, getting everything ready. I'm working on direct mail, so everything's starting to fall in place. So that means uh, the camp, the uh, fundraising has been good for you too. Fundraising, yes. I just got off of. I just had uh, a total of 13 fundraisers. Um, <laughs> so that's all I've been doing is raising money. So and then plus going around and talking to uh, Republican clubs and meeting people. So and having meet and greets all across the state. So. Rob, you have his cell, right? So I do. You can, just just checking. <laughs> I have Mr. Householder's numbers. <laughs> Eric, you're running for auditor, is that right? State auditor, that's correct, yes. What is the political element of the auditor? Why does it matter, the D or the R, when it comes down to the auditor? It does. It, it's basically a nonpartisan office, in, in a sense. Well, it, it, it could matter, though. I mean, if you well, think about it, you, if you if you have an auditor who is a... Republican, and you have a state government, you have the city government that he's auditing that is run by Democrats, you you might be able to make a political element out of it that way, because we make a political element out of everything. But you shouldn't. Like I said, uh, keep in mind, yeah. the auditor's main role is to be the watchdog of the taxpayer's money. I know you had uh, Mike Stewart on recently. Mm -hmm. yeah, most mornings I listen in and Thank uh, you. try to hear all the candidates, and I think one of the things that Mike was talking about as a candidate He'd like to uh, attain prosecutorial powers. Well, you've heard me talk about this several times. Your auditor already has prosecutorial power. There's no other office in state government that has more power to investigate everything, and that is your uh, your state auditor. So, Why doesn't the state auditor have more auditing power over the state government? They do. There's, it, the, the code is silent, but that's one of the things that I've been talking about on the campaign trail that I do believe that now is the time to audit all state agencies. And um, I believe taxpayers deserve it and demand it because it's, you know, there should be accountability because it's their money. So, yep. That leads me to this next question, which in regards to surpluses in departments at the end of the year, mm -hmm. fiscal year. So when Republicans took over, that was going to be a priority. We're going to find out who's banking money, and we're going to get it back into the general fund, the general revenue fund. And it be, in the beginning, you folks had a lot of trouble trying to get access to those records to find out who was holding back a lot of money that they hadn't spent and rolling it over. Uh, have you had more success on that as you've been in power longer? We have. Uh, a lot of it's uh, reappropriated language in the budget, like I spoke about last time when I, when I was on. And also, a majority of it, over $2 billion of it, is in special revenue funds. What happens many times, the legislature will create a lot of these committees, um, like education, we'll just use Mike Cornby uh, and his committee. Um, they'll, they'll pass a bill in the education committee. They'll set up a special revenue account. Um, of course, education is probably not a very good one for this example, but uh, uh, what will happen is it will allow uh, these agencies to collect a fee of some sort and uh, they stockpile this money into their special revenue accounts. And we have over $2 billion in special revenue of this $5.4 billion general revenue budget. So most of it is all in special revenue. Uh, state code does allow us to sweep special revenue accounts. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to do that because a lot of these agencies have already encumbered the money for something. So you've got to get to it early, and it's sometimes like finding a needle in a haystack because they're always going to tell you that this money is encumbered for something. you just got to keep asking the hard questions and drill down into it and find out what is encumbered and what is not. Any idea what the ballpark total amount of money is that uh, have rolled over in department accounts? Well, the reappropriate language is real simple. If uh, the auditor's office presents their budget to uh, the Finance Committee, and the Auditor's Office budget is $2.3 million. There's reappropriated language at the end of each one of these agencies that's in the budget bill that says whatever money is not spent, it rolls over to the next fiscal year. So if the Auditor's Office only spent $2 million and they were appropriated $2.3 million, then 300000 would be reappropriated. They'll come back the following budget cycle. They'll ask for 
million. They now say if they get 2.3, they'll have 2.6 million. So there is reappropriate language. You, in order to change that, you would have to obviously run a bill to take the reappropriate language out. And I think you're going to see that probably this uh, this session. In fact, uh, Delegate Gearhart out of Mercer County has uh, introduced that bill the last couple of years, and we've talked about it, and I think you may see it this session. So in regards to departments that have not been able to fully staff, you have to you have to provide the budget to fund those positions, but if the position is never filled, that's money that was appropriated but never spent. Does yes. that money get included in these sweeps? It can, yes, absolutely, yes. And it has happened. In fact, uh, we swept some of uh, DHHR's uh, uh, budget last session because of those vacancies. And uh, so, no, it does happen all the time. But you've got to be careful, obviously, if they are actively out there trying to replace some of this, some of these personnel. And uh, but it is, it's it's that's why they call it a budget. There, it's it's a projection or a budget of what they think that they will need for that fiscal year. So, is it possible for a department which is understaffed, like uh, say prisons or DHHR, to have? Uh, the ability to give bonuses to employees who you're, you're getting paid for a 40-hour week, but because there's not enough staff, you're actually working 60, maybe 70 hours a week to try to make up for all the work that needs to be done with these kids who are in the system. Is it possible to bonus these employees with some of these leftover funds? I'm not sure. I, I don't know the answer to that. But obviously, um, uh, wage and law requirements, I mean, if, obviously, if they're working overtime, they're entitled to overtime pay. But as far as uh, bon- bonuses, I'm not sure. Are you aware if any of them are getting overtime pay, Eric? I know that's kind of micromanaging, which you wouldn't get into with the department. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't know without. I do know one time with the state police, the state police agency, um, they were receiving a lot of overtime pay. Yeah, I think in corrections, too, there's a lot of yeah. overtime being done. Yeah. DHHR, same thing with CPS. They, they, they have to, by law, pay, pay overtime yeah. um, if they're working over. All right. Eric, thanks for your time this morning. Any final thoughts from you, sir? Uh, no, if you want to learn more about my campaign for state auditor, you can go to householderforauditor.com. Householder for Auditor. Is that the uh, the number four or F-O-R? F-O-R. All right. Hey, man, thanks. I appreciate it. Yep. See you guys. Bye. That's Eric Householder. No doubt in somebody's basement right now or attic fixing an HVAC system.